Hello, everybody, and welcome. Now, today we have a new uh, webinar and a new topic. So, today we are going to hear about tinnitus and forget about chips for ENTs and our geologists to succeed in better, mani better in managing patients. Our presenter today is a person from my country, so it's a Brazilian doctor. Uh, I'm always proud to present Brazilian people. Uh, Tanita Gans Sancha. Uh, she's Associate Professor at uh, Otto Ring Laryngology, University of São Paulo. Uh, and I'm, as you get, you are probably used to right now, uh, my name is Mariana Rosalind Jensen, I'm Education and Training Manager at Otometrics, and I will be your moderator. So, for those of you with the first time participating, all of you are muted to reduce background noise. It's possible to ask questions. If you look at your screen, in the right part, in the, the right side of your screen, there is a small taskbar. At that taskbar, you can ask, uh, write your questions, uh, and I can see the questions that you are right. The questions will be kept to the end of the of the session. So uh, we will first listen to the presentation, and then at the end, uh, I will ask the questions to Dr. Tanita. Uh, if you have uh, problems during the webinar, you are also welcome to write to me on the sidebar. And if we are not able to answer all the questions because of time, then we will write to you afterwards. I will send the, the presentation to our presenter and uh, ask her to answer the questions uh, for you, and then we will send it for you. Uh, the webinar will be available later on uh, uh, in our web, so if you want to watch afterwards again, you will be able to do that. So now I will make uh, Dr. Tanit uh, as our presenter, so we can see her screen. Welcome, and uh, I'm, I'm very uh, happy that you accept the invitation to do that uh, presentation with us. Okay. Thank you, Mariana, for the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for being present. Um, just for you to understand a little bit my introduction, I am here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I am an ontologist. I am considered to be a different one because I'm almost fully dedicated to study tinnitus, and usually physicians don't like tinnitus. Uh, I have my mind behaving as a researcher's mind, but my heart behaves like a clinician uh, heart. So I started to study tinnitus 24 years ago and created many different national actions to promote tinnitus awareness and to motivate professionals to study tinnitus. And more recently, I have challenged myself to understand better the process of cure of tinnitus as much as possible. And we are slowly moving in this way. So in this short webinar, I propose a collective brainstorm. Let's start. You, you can see here some of our, uh, the actions that we, we, we did here in Brazil, a national campaign called Orange November, which was inspired in the Pink October. The year bleeds the theoretical practical courses, the National Day of Tinnitus Consciousness. We have a, 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 an, a YouTube channel. We have the Tinnitus TV. We have the support group. We have a book. We have lots of things here trying to promote uh, uh, better understanding of tinnitus and better involvement of both professional and population. So let's start with the iceberg that represents the knowledge about tinnitus. Just a minimum part is published and accessible to everyone. Research is, is indeed very, very needed and very welcome, but it demands a long time to be published, to be reproduced in future studies, to reach consensus among researchers. Moreover, science emphasizes the research of treatments through randomized clinical trials. 
Although I admire very much the rigorous methods of research, I can clearly see some problems in the case of tinnitus. First, it's usually expensive and time demanding because tinnitus does not respond quickly to treatments. Few treatments options consistently, reproducibly uh, respond, um, work better for tinnitus than placebo and for a long time. Second, when we apply some of the results of the randomized clinical trials in daily practice, patients not always accept or fit the criteria to be successful. And third, I'm not aware of any treatment that led to the cure in randomized clinical trials, but I do know patients in clinical practice who feel cured. So, to me, it seems that randomized clinical trial and clinical practice are different realities and they are far away from each other. On the other hand, there are lots of knowledge which are not shared, which uh, represents the lower part of the iceberg. This is the non-published knowledge. They come from the clinical practice. So my first intention was to reach that major part of knowledge, which is still out of science. So looking deeper into clinical practice with open mind is definitely a way of facing more of this universe behind tinnitus. So my first tip for you, never ever neglect the knowledge that comes from the non-published um, facts. Uh, yet, because someday it will be published, but then maybe it will be too late for you. So it may be part of the truth, if, even if it's not published yet. My second team work as a team, at least an ENT doctor and an audiologist like Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Whenever possible, increase your team like Dr. House did with other professionals. It's very good to have a psychologist, a dentist, a physiotherapist or manual therapist whenever you are dealing with tinnitus patients. My third tip for you, investigate, uh, sorry, uh, look at the patient as a whole, integrally, and not just an affected ear or brain. One single person may have a combination of factors to present tinnitus, coming from inside or from outside the ear. If we manage these factors uh, properly, we can decrease tinnitus even if we don't target the ear or the brain directly. So look at this uh, figure. If I have uh, uh, an old woman, a 70-year-old woman, or if I have uh, a young boy uh, with uh, presbycusis or acoustic traumas, but if they also have diabetes, hypertension, caffeine abuse, or depression, or high cholesterol levels, sugar abuse, anxiety, or bruxes, if I take care of these other things that might cause or influence tinnitus, then I will just have the autologic problem. But even in this situation, the loud tinnitus can become a low tinnitus. So this is my main thinking about the investigation and treatment of tinnitus patients. The other tip is try to investigate beyond the audiometry. All our patients have at least a detailed clinical history that we will see in a few minutes. The complete physical exam, including ear, nose, throat, TMJ, and neck, 
the, audio, the extended audiologic battery composed by pure tone audiometry, the high frequency audiometry, the pitch and loudness matching of tinnitus, and the loudness discomfort level, and blood exams, at least the um, cell blood count to check for anemia, the glucose, the cholesterol, the triglycerides to check uh, about uh, carbohydrate uh, problems, and the thyroid exams. So all of them can interfere with tinnitus. So whenever needed, then we ask for electrophysiological or image exams, and also, we can ask for multidisciplinary evaluation, uh, especially um, the dentist or the physiotherapist, uh, if we are considering the somatosensory tinnitus. Um, we will check a little bit my medical protocol, uh, different from other protocols. Um, it's not focused on the handicap, only, but mainly to establish the main sus suspects about the diagnosis. So let's see. The first step is to ask everything I can about the tinnitus itself. Um, for how long it exists, the type of tinnitus, where it is in the right or left ear on both, if there is a worst side, which type it is, one single sound or a mix of at least two sounds, if it is pulsatile, like a vascular tinnitus, or if it is uh, a muscular um, tinnitus, like a click, uh, a repetitive click, uh, how it appeared, like a sudden tinnitus or slowly and progressive, how it is nowadays, constant or intermittent, uh, what, is, uh, what are the factors that worsen or improve tinnitus, and in what it interference um, nowadays in sleep pattern, in concentration, in emotional balance, in social life, and which are the concerns of the patients about the tinnitus. Uh, do they concern about having a severe illness, uh, maybe deafness in the future, getting louder, or other things? Um, then I start to ask about the other autologic symptoms, like hearing loss, aural fullness, sound intolerance, dizziness. And when I finish, I ask them to give, uh, to choose one number, from 0 to 10 to represent their annoyance which e with each of these autologic symptoms. So this is my way of having an idea about which are the worst problems in their daily life and not only in the exams. So this is useful for me to consider for treatment strategy. Then I like very much to ask about the frequent pains that they might have in the ear, in the head, in the neck, or in TMJ. And this is especially useful for us to think about the somatosensory group, uh, which is the one related to TMJ and neck that might have other ways of treatment than the regular tinnitus. And finally, I ask about the metabolic part. I want to know uh, how many meals he makes each day, if he has caffeine abuse, if he eats candies or sugar very often, and if he is addicted to sugar. So this metabolic part is very useful for us to determine the special diets that can improve tinnitus. Then I start searching for noise pollution and electromagnetic waves pollution, radio frequency pollution. So I ask about proximity from antennas, 
we, about the direct contact, the direct touching of the ear with mobile phones for more than one hour per day, and regular noise exposure for pleasure or for work reasons. Then I ask about other diseases, the medication that they are talking, uh, they, they are having today, the past medications and past treatments for tinnitus, and the uh, diseases in their families. And then, after the physical exam, after the, the complementary exams, we have the main ideas about the tinnitus etiology. And sometimes I have three hypotheses, and I put one and two and three. And when the hypotheses are clear to me, it's much easier to start the tinnitus, uh, the, the first treatment. So I can choose very customizedly uh, between uh, changes in diet, medication, sound therapy, amplification, electrical stimulation or modulation, uh, behavioral, behavioral treatments, or uh, rarely about neurotologic surgery. So my next tip is try to organize your mind about the subgroups of tinnitus patients. A pure auditory tinnitus, like the one that we have after parties, shows, etc., rock concerts, is very, very different than metabolic tinnitus, which in turn is very, very difficult, uh, very different from somatic sensory tinnitus, which in turn is very different from vascular and muscular tinnitus. So if you try to organize like different drawers, you, you will see that uh, uh, managing tinnitus patients will be much easier. Um, another tip that is very profitable for professionals is to consider very simple things in the patient's life. So I like to tell them, try to avoid too much caffeine or carbohydrates or prolonged fast periods, noise exposure, the contact, the direct contact of the ear with the mobile, try to use the speaker or the microphone, uh, avoid the use of screen light before one hour before bed, and try to avoid negative thoughts about uh, tinnitus especially. And tra ta sorry, try to add hydration, the works the body works much better and also the ears when we are hydrated. So never forget the water. Physical exercise, low level sounds, stress management the way you like with yoga, relaxation or meditation that I love meditation and try to add pleasure moments in your life. All of them are, um, can make the difference. Uh, if you are a doctor, at least here in Brazil, just doctors can medicate uh, patients. Remember that there are a lot of different uh, categorizations of uh, drugs that may help tinnitus patients. Uh, usually they are controversial in randomized clinical trials because few of them have surpassed the placebo in a very consistent way. However, in open studies, some of them reached up to 50% of improvement. So they are not nothing, they are something for us to use. So there are very, very different uh, categories of uh, medications. And the way I try to select them for my specific patients is to consider what else the tinnitus patients have that might be treated by any specific drug. So, for example, if the tinnitus patient has headache or pain in the neck, usually we can choose a pain reliever. 
so that we can try to reach both pain and tinnitus. If the patient is older or have hypertension or high cholesterol levels and we imagine that, we, uh, that he has a problem with circulation, microcirculation, we can use a vasodilator or a blood flow modulator uh, and so on. If the patient is depressed, we can use the antidepressants. So always trying to reach other things uh, that the patient might have that the medication was initially target to and then the the effect on tinnitus may have may be may happen secondarily so um, the other tip is to select the sound therapy that better fits the patient needs and then here I talk about the cost, at least here in Brazil, cost is a very important thing. Uh, aesthetics here in Brazil, people are always uh, uh, very Spanish, so we need to consider the aesthetics. The difficulty or the easily in using the in, in day to day. So here I selected the main types of um, sound therapy that uh, were published in a few years ago. So you can choose about acoustic CR modulation, serenade, hearing aids, conventional hearing aids, combination units, um, phase out, phase shift, or whatever uh, may help your tinnitus. So my 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 advice in this field is try to be flexible try to um, understand more than one type of treatment for your patient because you don't have one single type of treatment that fits everybody that is effective and makes tinnitus patients happy so the better the, the more flexible you are, the more knowledgeable you are between uh, among the options, the, the easier will be for you to make your tinnitus patient happier than before. And something that I would like very, I would like you very much to do after the webinar, because we won't have time, is to watch the videos that are in our um, uh, YouTube uh, channel. So if you go to YouTube and you you add my name, my co complete name, Tenet Guns Sanchez, you will see some of the videos. Um, let me check here. You will see some of the videos that we were able to do with teen, with ex sufferers. So with people that used to have at least three months of tinnitus, so they were considered chronic tinnitus, and they did something, and this something uh, is very different from one patient to the other, and then they were free of tinnitus for at least six months. So this is part of our ongoing uh, research, and I'm very, very proud of it because we are trying to find and interview uh, patients, ex-patients or uh, patients from other doctors, from other audiologists, from other professionals, indeed, uh, who reached what they call the cure of tinnitus by different means. So as this is a research, all of these videos have about five minutes and the questions are exactly the same. So each patient, and you can see the initials of uh, their names, each patient responded the questions about how was your tinnitus at the time you have tinnitus, the type of sound, the location, the, uh, the causes, uh, what did you do uh, to improve? and for how long you don't have tinnitus anymore. 
So this is very, very useful for us to believe that tinnitus patients really can get good results. And this is very important for everybody because, at least here in Brazil, we are trained to believe that tinnitus has no cure, there is nothing to do, so you have to learn to live with it. And this is very demotivating for professionals to encourage themselves to treat patients. And of course, this is terrible for the patients themselves. So this is something that we are trying to make a difference here, um, uh, making this, uh, uh, this partial research available in the YouTube channel so everybody can check. These videos are, um, are made in Portuguese, of course, but they have the subtitles, these videos have the subtitles in English so that more people can understand. And just by chance, if some of you uh, that are now watching the, the, the talk, if you know any ex-sufferer, please, 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 please email me at tanitsanchez uh, at gmail.com. We have so far 59 patients who have already been interviewed. Uh, not, all, not all of them accept to record the videos. Some of them are very shy, but we want to reach 100 uh, patients uh, interviewed. So whenever you can help me, I will be very, very glad. And just to finish, my last um, tip is think wider, open your mind, do like Albert Einstein. I love this phrase, the mind that opens to a new idea never returns to its original size. So thank you very much again, Mariana, and thank you very much for the patience in uh, watching the, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very inspiring presentation. Uh, I have some questions for you. I, I hope you have the time uh, to answer for us. Okay. Um, what, is the, what is the significance of mobile contact of the EU? Perfect. Um, there are some um, research about the, the damage that electromagnetic waves can do in the more sensitive way and uh, the more sensitive ears so to my mind now uh, i think about electromagnetic pollution in and noise pollution in a very similar way there is some ears are resistant so they don't have any symptom and some ears are sensitive which are the, the ones which are more prone to have tinnitus and or hearing loss whenever the direct contact with this, the mobile phone, are, um, uh, the, there is the direct contact uh, of the ear with the mobile phone because whenever you are using the mobile, it is changing, it's uh, changing, not sorry, it's sharing, sharing the electromagnetic wave with the, the closer antenna. So the radio frequency radiation that, uh, that comes from the mobile with uh, the, 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 the changing energy with the, the antenna can damage the ear. So this may account for unilateral tinnitus in the ear that the patients use the mobile phone more than the other ear. So sorry if I, if I was not that clear, but I think you can understand. So uh, the point is that when you investigate patients with unilateral tinnitus and you don't find any, any, any clue in the medical and audiological investigate, uh, investigation, try to check whether or not he uses the, mo he talks on the mobile phone uh, uh, straight in the ear. Okay, there's another question. Many clinical trials shows that Jinko 
biloba and beta histine doesn't have an, any effect on tinnitus and hearing loss. Perfect. So, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, if you go just for randomized clinical trials, you will see that um, there are um, studies that do not show efficiency and there are a few that show efficiency. If you go through, um, what's the name of the, the if you go to, to Cochrane, uh, you will mostly see that there is controversial. So controversial to me is different than proving that it's not effective. So in the clinical practice, and, and that's why, sorry, and that's why I started my talk saying that research and clinical practice are far away of each other. And so in clinical practice, if you try to use ginkgo in specific subgroups of tinnitus patients, which are the ones who might um, benefit from microvasodilatation, like acoustic trauma, like hypertension, like high, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol levels, maybe you can um, have a better result than what if you use ginkgo in other types of tinnitus. And the, my concern about randomized clinical trials is that the population of tinnitus patients uh, that is enrolled is very, very heterogeneous. And what we do in our clinical practice is try to separate uh, the, the tinnitus patients in different subgroups. That's why I think that the, any, any, any of these uh, drugs which are already um, studied in randomized clinical trials may have a role in specific subgroups of tinnitus patients. We have a lot of questions, so one <laughs> more. <laughs> That's good. very good. The only problem yes. is that we don't have time. <laughs> but yes. this is good. I will give you two more and then uh, I will write to you. The other ones you can send it to me and I send to the participants. Okay. Uh, do you use a tinnitus uh, handicap inventory? Yes, I use the, the um, THI usually. But yes. I like the, yes, the THI because it's one of the few uh, ones that we have translated in Portuguese. Okay. For sound therapy, what is your approach? Partial masking or total masking or TRT? Um, I like partial masking and TRT, and I just use total masking for those patients who are desperate, desperate, like an initial um, management, and then as soon as they feel better, they can breathe, they can talk, then can, they can think, then I decrease the amount of masking. So my ideal um, sound therapy uh, mix um, counseling with partial masking or um, habituation. Uh, do you measure the tinnitus? So trying to find the frequency and the, the level of the tinnitus? Yes, that was what I called pitch and loudness matching when I uh, talked about uh, the audiological battery. And do you use that then when you were feeding the hearing aid? You, do you use this information uh, while feeding the, not the hearing aid, but the masking? Um, uh, well, as I'm not an audiologist, I'm an otologist. When I refer yeah. the patient to the the, the audiologist, um, usually I, I let them, I let her free to to adapt the hearing aid whenever uh, uh, the way they want. But uh, usually they don't use the the minimum masking level to consider uh -huh. the point. They uh, they select the adaptation in a very clinical way. And I use I use the minimal masking level and the loudness uh, of tinnitus pre and post treatment to check 
whether or not the, the treatment that I selected had was effective or not. Okay. okay. I have some more questions, but I think we should uh, stop now. I, I really would like to say thank you very much for your presentation. It was really inspiring. Uh, we could also see for the participants, there was a lot of participants and uh, a lot of questions, and, and, and that's pretty difficult in a webinar. But okay. uh, it, it was really good. So thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you everybody for participating and uh, be in touch and look at our website to see the program and the next webinar. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everybody. You too. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>